The deadline to reunite young immigrant children with their parents has come and gone. So why are dozens of families still separated? It's Pride Weekend in San Diego. We'll talk with the local author and journalist showcasing the city's LGBT history. And just six votes separated the top two candidates for one city council seat. Why the incumbent is in for a serious fight in November. I'm Ebony Monet, and the KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of the week's top stories. I'm Ebony Monet, in for Mark Sauer, and joining me at the KPBS Roundtable is Tony Perry, former San Diego Bureau Chief for the LA Times, Maya Shri Krishnan, immigration reporter for Voice of San Diego, and Lillian Faderman, a San Diego-based author and LGBT historian, and Andrew Keats, a senior investigative reporter for Voice of San Diego. Let's begin with another turbulent week for immigration. Courts are rolling out a new way to clear backlogs of cases in San Diego. And when it comes to reuniting families, President Trump had this to say when asked about missing a court-ordered deadline to return the youngest children to their parents. Well, I have a solution. Tell people not to come to our country illegally. That's the solution. Don't come to our country illegally. Come like other people do, come legally. So, Tony, this was his response to reporters asking him about missing the deadline for some of the children, the youngest children under five years old. What's the latest? Well, the latest is uh, that of 103 children under age five, it, the government reported uh, to the judge here in San Diego, 57 had been reunited, but that uh, several dozen more are what they call ineligible. Why? They can't find the parents. The parents have been deported. Uh, the parents have criminal records. They're just something that makes the government uh, ill at ease about giving over these children to these adults. ACLU says, your process is so long and involved, it's impractical. It's up to the judge, maybe, to say, move it along faster, don't take chances with these kids. But of course, and that's a small number, wait till we get the kids between five and 17. The numbers we've been told, maybe 2,000. Wait till we see that and what that looks like. As my old uh, newspaper said editorially, this program that uh, the Trump administration rolled out was uh, reckless, it was impractical, and it's been shockingly poorly executed. I'll let them speak. I don't, I'm not going to disagree with that. It, on the ground, it sure looks like that. And speaking of shocking, when you say parents have been deported, any indication of what will happen with those families? Well. There doesn't seem to be a program of going down, getting them, and bringing them back. Uh, although under the Obama administration, there were what they call humanitarian uh, visas so that they could come back and, and pick up a child that they left here. But so far, again, uh, plan A that the, uh, that the Trump administration cooked up doesn't seem to have accounted for that or thought of that, and they're now desperately trying to find a camp, uh, plan B. And, and so we just don't know. What about the, of the people they deported? One was to Romania. Are they going all the way to Romania and bringing him back to, so that he can uh, reunite with a child? I just don't know. And, and the government, uh, I think it, I think my will, will agree with me, has not been transparent. They won't tell us where these kids are. They won't tell us really the numbers. And the ACLU uh, has sued for a level of transparency, okay, but they've also agreed with the government that a lot has to be kept secret. I don't know journalistically whether I like that. I'd like to know where our government is keeping these kids, where they're being reunited, and what's the numbers on it so far. Not a lot of transparency out of the federal government. And Maya, bringing you into this conversation, another issue that's been coming out of these court proceedings that has been shocking to some young children, um, reportedly as young as one years old, appearing alone without a parent or guardian in the court made to um, respond whether or not they can understand the proceedings. Are you seeing that here in San Diego? And, and what's the explanation for this happening nationally? Well, so that's actually been happening for quite a while. Um, when children come to the U.S. alone, or in these cases where they've been separated from their parents, they're only guaranteed an attorney when they're in the custody of Health and Human Services. And so if they're released to a sponsor or relative, they're not guaranteed any legal representation. And what's happened is with these child separations is that they've 
both increase the public scrutiny on what's happening to those kids um, and increase the number of kids because now it's not just kids who are showing up to the border alone, but they've also added a couple more thousand kids who they've separated from their parents. And what about the, the families that have been reunited? Um, there was some talk about housing families together in detention facilities. What's going to happen to the, these families that have that been reunited? Well, so there are rules in place about how long families can be detained um, and the conditions under which they can be detained. And the Trump administration did try to challenge those uh, and a judge in Los Angeles ruled against them. So it appears that they're going to be going back to the policy they were using before, which is for the most part, families will be released with ankle monitors or other sort of mo like monitoring to come back to their hearings. It, it looks as if they're moving back to the uh, policy that the Obama administration used and that Trump uh, et al. Uh, gave a uh, short shrift to, called it catch and release, very, uh, very uh, dreadful phrase. And we're talking about human beings, not carp. But it looks that seems to be where we're going here. Well, given the numbers, we then are going to have to track thousands of uh, people. Let's see how well that uh, works. I, I went down uh, south of the border to Tijuana to watch the uh, folks who are trying to cross illegally and seek asylum. My colleague uh, Jody Hammond and I went down there for the Washington Post, and what we found, uh, the desperation will just uh, curl your hair of uh, these folks, uh, women with children. And I don't think that uh, the fear of, uh, of a harsh uh, life when you get here by the federal government is going to deter that. There'll be a little drop in numbers, one month, two months. Long term, given what's going on in Central America, et cetera, I just don't see it uh, changing. And so we're in for this for a long time, here, particularly here in San Diego, and more so in Texas, because they get the Central American uh, flow. And I do also think, I mean, there's been reports that have come out that show that families that are released for their asylum hearings do come back more than 90% of the time. Um, and so a lot of this is the government taking a really small percentage of people who don't show up to their hearings and, and using that to try and detain them for longer. Um, but it's actually just an attempt to deter them. You know, one thing that Jody and I found that it shocked me, you talk to these folks and where are you going? And I thought, well, they would say, we're going to San Diego, we're going to LA. A lot of the folks that are trying to get asylum and are fleeing Guatemala and Honduras, they're going to relatives in Utah, New Jersey, uh, upstate New York. I mean, the idea that uh, immigration, legal or illegal, is just a border issue, uh, that's, that's really old. No, it's a national issue. And it isn't just something we have to deal with along the border. It's, it's a national issue. Uh, but again, we, uh, we, our plan A didn't, isn't uh, working all that well. And as Maya points out, the children, uh, I think, are, the, are suffering. And so while it would be fun just to watch journalistically another Keystone Cops-esque uh, federal program that doesn't work and employees and all this, uh, it becomes less fun when you consider the damage being done to these children. The psychologists and the social workers who know about this kind of stuff say it is substantial, long range, and these children are being hurt by a federal, United States federal government policy that we're all responsible for. And can you clarify, you, you both have, have brought up um, asylum seekers. How are these cases being handled differently than someone else who may have crossed the border illegally? Well, so an asylum seeker, you can ask for asylum in the U.S. whether you cross through a port of entry le just qu legally or whether you cross between ports of entry, which is what the government says is illegal. Um, it's just basically saying that I am scared to go back to my country. Um, but even then, they've tightened it. Uh, the Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, uh, held a press conference and he said, we're tightening it. Uh, it isn't good enough that you're afraid because your husband uh, has been beating you or that your, uh, your neighborhood uh, thugs have been raping you. You've got to tie it into a political situation or that you're being victimized because you're helping the police try to put MS-13 away or something. So they're beginning to restrict uh, w the causes, the legitimate causes that can get you asylum. Now, how is that going to work on the ground with uh, individual judges? We'll find out. But they have anticipated uh, this and are tightening that up too. So again, we're going to be in for that for a long time. And Maya, you've done some reporting this week on Operation Streamline um, to a fast track program. What exactly is it? How is it working here? 
So uh, when Jeff Sessions announced zero tolerance in April, basically what he wanted the federal government to start doing was criminally prosecuting everyone who crossed the border between ports of entries, um, because that is the illegal way to do it. And it has caused a surge in these illegal entry misdemeanor cases that at least uh, in the federal courts in San Diego, we hadn't been charging people with for the most part for decades. I mean, sometimes if someone had a felony um, for illegally entering multiple times, they would knock it down, but it, it was very, it wasn't used very often. And suddenly we're having hundreds of those cases filed every single week and the courts were really struggling to deal with them. And so they implemented Operation Streamline, which is a program that has been implemented in all of the other border states since about 2005 on and off. Um, to create basically an entirely separate court system for these yeah. migrants who are coming across. So it's one room and there are people who are arrested one day, they're brought into court the next, and they are arraigned, they plead, and they're sentenced, uh, and then they are deported uh, either that evening or the next day. You know, while well, well, Trump is getting pounded on the head by editorial pages and columnists and advocacy groups and ACLU, and that's fine, he ran, that's comes with a turf when you, uh, you're the man at the top and you've made the comments he has made. Uh, however, it also uh, bears noting what the judge in Los Angeles said when the federal government tried to monkey around with, uh, with a court decision of some years ago that limited what they could do with the children. She got pretty annoyed and wrote a pretty scathing report. And among other things, she said, you know, this problem is because of 20 years of congressional inaction. And I think that we ought to keep that in mind, too. Whatever you think of the Trump administration's approach, the United States Congress hasn't helped much at all because they're in gridlock on this. So, Very interesting and emotional issue that we will continue to cover in the days ahead. And right now we'll turn to Pride Weekend here in San Diego. The local celebration started in the 1970s in response to the Stonewall Rebellion. It's now an event that draws hundreds of thousands of people. Our guest today is author and historian Lillian Faderman. She's the curator of the LGBT San Diego Stories of Struggle and Triumphs at the San Diego History Center. Lillian, this is the first exhibit of its kind in Balboa Park. What type of support did you find? Wonderful support. First of all, the History Center was very encouraging about doing the exhibit. And I, I found uh, a terrific repository of LGBTQ material. It was the Lambda Archives that started in the 1980s. We also had uh, donors who gave us artifacts going way back even to 1946. So the, the exhibit uh, starts actually in, in the 1770s and goes all the way up to the present with photographs and artifacts of various kinds. So you, you talk about some of the things that people will see at this exhibit. Um, what do you hope people take away from this experience? Well, I, I hope that uh, we've addressed uh, the the LGBTQ community, but also the rest of San Diego. For LGBTQ people, I think it's important that they know how long the history of, of struggle has been and how eventually there were triumphs. Things aren't perfect yet, but certainly immeasurably better than they were in the mid 20th century, for instance. For the rest of San Diego, I hope they'll learn something about their neighbors, about people who are their uh, friends and sons and daughters and, and fellow employees and, and people that they see on the streets. I, I hope that this will tell all of San Diego something about how long the history has been, what a difficult history it's been, and and how uh, we're achieving a measure of success in becoming first-class American citizens. You know, we mentioned Stonewall, of course. Stonewall riots in New York. We maybe didn't have anything quite that dramatic, but is there an event or a person that you can uh, put your finger on and say, that helped turn things? Yeah, yeah the, the Stonewall riots were in 1969. San Diego was astonishingly quick to respond. Uh, the, the first response was in 1970. A group of students at San Diego State started an organization called the Gay Liberation Front. It was the same name as an organization that started in New York just weeks after the Stonewall riots. But the Gay Liberation Front did terrific things like they 
were the first to protest publicly against police harassment in 1971. They held a picket in front of the police station that was incredibly brave for 1971. They were behind the, uh, the first gay pride parade in uh, 1974. It was an unpermitted parade. They could not get a permit from the city, and so they, uh, they marched on the sidewalk, stopping for the lights, and continued marching. Only 200 people were in that first parade. It went from Hobo Park to Balboa Park. And uh, now there are at least 200,000 people in the pride parades. First mayor to uh, march in the parade was Maureen O'Connor. Yes, yes, yeah. And you're a longtime historian and an author. How did this experience compare? Well, I, I found that um, San Diego was astonishingly quick to respond to what became the uh, the modern gay revolution. Uh, as I said, there was the founding of uh, uh, a young group, the Gay Liberation Front in 1970, but very soon uh, mainstream LGBTQ people, or as they were called in the 1970s, gay people or gay and lesbian people, began to uh, found organizations such as the Log Cabin Republicans, which was a uh, gay uh, Republican organization, the San Diego Democrats, uh, the San Diego, San Diego Democratic Club, it was called, which was uh, a gay democratic organization. The United San Diego Elections Committee, which was a gay and lesbian organization founded in the 1970s. I, I think what had happened in the 1970s is that uh, gay people of, of all classes, of uh, various ages realized that they had to begin to organize and fight for equal rights. And that was very quick in, in the history of the new gay revolution. How, how the fact that this is a military town, how has that impacted gay life or the emergence of gay rights? Yes, or we, has it? Uh, we, we talk in, in the exhibit about uh, an incident that happened uh, in the late 1950s, early 1960s of an admiral, Admiral Selden Hooper, who uh, uh, had been much decorated. He retired. It was found that he was homosexual, and he was forced back into the military. And in 1962, he was court-martialed, and he was stripped of his rank and all of his benefits. The military has come a long way since then. And in 2012, uh, gays and lesbians who were in the military were permitted to march in uniform in the gay pride parade. So that, that's a real measure of success, I think. And Lillian, you talk about how the city of San Diego was quick to act in that same breath. Um, San Diego has had several current and recent politicians, including Tony Atkins, Todd Gloria, Bonnie DeManis, um, yes. um, who are gay. What does this say about tolerance yes. here in the city yes. of San Diego? I have found, as, as I put this exhibit together, it's really quite remarkable how supportive San Diego has been for lesbian and gay politicians, beginning in 1993, when Chris Kehoe was elected to the uh, city council. Since then, there has always been at least one gay or lesbian or now LGBTQ person on the city council, including uh, Georgette Gomez, who was elected as uh, an out lesbian, calls herself queer. Um, not only that, but San Diego has helped put uh, out LGBTQ people uh, into the state assembly and to the state senate. Uh, Christine Kehoe served in both the assembly and the senate. Todd Gloria is presently in the assembly. And Tony Atkins was not only the president of the California state assembly, but she is now the, uh, uh, the president pro tem of the senate, which is really remarkable, I think, that San Diego has been so supportive of gay and lesbian politicians. Something to be proud of in an yes. exciting time with Pride yes. Yes. happening this weekend. And we're going to turn now to the San Diego City Council race. An incumbent hasn't lost a seat in nearly 30 years. The current city council president might see that streak end in November. 
Attorney Monica Montgomery finished ahead of Myrtle Cole in the primary by a razor thin margin, margins, pardon me, of just six votes. Andrew Keith spent some time in the district to find out why. Andrew, um, how significant is this upset? I think it's very significant. Um, now, certainly, it's not definitive as a primary. There were there. You know, I think there was most people expected that both of these candidates would move on to the general, and they will still. So, uh, you know, she won by six votes, but it particularly wouldn't have mattered if she had lost by six votes instead. Uh, nonetheless, I think it is very significant, and I think there's two reasons. One is this is a safe Democratic seat. Um, so this is an inner party challenge. And the other point is that uh, Myrtle Cole is council president. She is, by title, the second most powerful person in City Hall. She has a platform to raise large issues, to determine what's on the docket, to decide which city council members are on which committees, which really does set the business of City Hall in a lot of ways. And so despite the fact that she's running in a safe Democratic district and she has this perch from which to run, she has nonetheless been beaten uh, by somebody in her own party. And not only that, there was other people in the race. So she lost by six votes, but she also, 61% of her district who turned out to vote, voted against her. So, you know, the, she only got 39% of the vote in a safe seat, running as an incumbent, despite being a city council president. Uh, that was really, in a lot of ways, why I wanted to go talk to people in the district about this. It wasn't just that Monica Montgomery had done so well, but it was such a clear sign of dissatisfaction for 61% of people to register a vote against her. Well, Myrtle uh, Cole, former police officer, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. got in trouble when she yeah. didn't really... Uh, Get her words correctly. She seemed to be implying racial profiling is okay by cops, and she apologized and all the rest of it. Yeah. And and uh, her opponent made some hay out of that. Mm -hmm. Do you see expanding that in the runoff uh, so that police conduct in the district, Paradise Hills, etc., mm -hmm. becomes more of an issue, or is this an issue that just it's something that was said maladroit? And we're I mean, moving it's an on. Issue in that district. Yeah, so, certainly. Yeah, I mean, it is. It, it is an issue in that district. I, so, I, a, couple, a couple things to say about that. For one, you know, I, I, I asked Myrtle Cole about that, and she said, uh, she said I didn't hear about that much at all. The only people who bring that up to me are uh, Monica Montgomery's supporters. Well, problem is, at least so far, she has more supporters than Myrtle Cole does. Uh, so, there's a math problem there about whether that is or isn't a problem. Um, the other is. You know, for instance, the district attorney's race, which was going on at the same time, uh, became in a lot of ways a proxy fight for these exact issues, for, for issues of criminal justice, racial profiling, the way people, particularly in that district, feel they have a relationship with uh, SDPD. And Genevieve Jones-Wright, who was elevating those issues, did very, very well in that district. Um, so I don't see it going away. I, I would also say that it wouldn't be a to call it a complete walk back, but in my interview with Myrtle Cole, I think she didn't sound particularly apologetic about those comments. What she said wasn't, I didn't mean what I said, and I am apologize that people took it that way. What she said was, no one wants to pay attention to what was happening before I made those comments, and that is that someone was murdered outside of my uh, council office, and all I cared about was catching that person, and I wish somebody cared more about the victims. Now. You could agree or disagree with that perspective, but it isn't exactly an apology. It's it, it's more of an explanation and kind of a, a, in some ways keeping the debate alive. So to be fair, Cole has the support of mm -hmm. some of the labor unions as well as the county Democratic Party. Is that enough to tip the scale in her favor in November? I think under normal circumstances, we would almost certainly say yes. As I say, this is a strongly Democratic district. This, this is not a district where you could run with uh, as a Republican or. Um, without strong Democratic support. Certainly that's what she's banking on. She told me um, I didn't stage much of a campaign at all. I didn't have a campaign manager. We weren't working a ground campaign um, saying, going as far as to say, w I was taken by surprise uh, in the, with this result as well. Um, so now she's making the bet and others, her supporters are making the bet that when the labor unions get involved, when they start putting out their uh, voter turnout apparatus, when the uh, county party, which is which has endorsed her, gets involved and starts um, turning out their their mail lists and and starts spending money on the race. That this will that this will dissipate. This this slim margin will disappear, and she will, uh, particularly as turnout increases between the primary and the general, 
that that block of voters which are less engaged are going to be more likely to be swayed not just by her campaign but also her ballot title she still has the advantage of being listed as city council president well, right that, there on that, the ballot that sense of the people out there is that they've been forgotten by yeah. city hall yeah but yet you story pointed out a, a slew of projects yeah the city's throwing some decent money mm -hmm. is that a justifiable complaint or is that a more an emotional feeling that city hall forgets about us yeah, I, well, so it's complicated. For one, um, those are sentiments that I think have built up over the last 20 or 30 years, and a good run of capital improvement projects in a two, three, four year period probably is not going to wipe away all those concerns regardless. Um, certainly, Council President Cole would like to point out that this capital improvement budget has done very well for District 4 recently. Yeah. Infrastructure spending has been higher there than in some other districts, and she, uh, you know, is able to point out libraries that, that were built and, and we'll large projects that are We'll have to wrap it up right so. there. Thank you so much. We are out of time. That wraps up another week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. Thank you to Tony Perry and Maya Shri Christian, Andrew Keats, and Lillian Faderman for joining us. A reminder, all of the stories we discussed today are available on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Ebony Monet. Thanks for joining us on the Roundtable.